Thank you, Mas. Well, yeah, I also want to thank Mas and Bing Hai for organizing this and inviting me. Um, it has been really great so far. Um, yeah, as Mas said, I, um, I have been asked to give the solid state chemistry uh, tutorial today. So that means um, the first 20 minutes of my talk are basically going to be a very, uh, yeah, a chemistry lecture. Because when I was thinking about how solid state chemists think about drug materials, I realized that I might have um, to introduce some concepts um, we use uh, frequently in chemistry to basically tell, tell the story better. So um, I think after 20 minutes I will start talking about direct materials. Um, so this is a, yeah, I want to give a general introduction first about what solid state chemistry is about. And so traditionally, um, solid state chemistry thinks about yeah, crystal structure, the, the arrangement of matter. Basically, like if you have a certain set of elements, how do they combine um, to form a set of crystal structure? And um, can we find any rules when uh, a certain structure type is adopted? And um, this often depends on uh, like some trends we find in the periodic table, like for example, um, atomic or ionic radii or also on um, electron counting a lot. And um, so here, this is a picture of a structural map we sometimes like to construct in solid state chemistry. I did that during my PhD. And this is for X, Y, Z phases, um, where um, they're all isoelectronic, so this is not about electron counting yet, but they um, are composed of different elements. And here, the radius of the X element, which is barium, strontium, calcium, and manganese, is plotted on the X axis. And on the y-axis, um, there's this sum of the y and the z elements, like the radii of them plotted. And then the different colored dots um, are representing different structure type. And so then you can see that there are certain regions within this um, diagram where a certain structure type is stable. So you can see that the ratio of different radii is very important for defining a certain crystal structure. And so when we think about... Um, ionic radii or atomic radii, um, trends in the periodic table are very useful. So there are some general trends, for example, that the um, atomic radii is, um, increases if you go down and this way in the periodic table. And um, if you have ionic radii, it also depends on the oxidation state, but if they're all charged the same way, you can follow this general trend that atoms here are going to be larger than up here. Another important trend um, we need to worry about often is um, electronegativity because the difference in electronegativity in elements um, gives you an idea how ionic a compound is going to be or how more metallic the bonding will be. And so this increases like this direction up here and there. And so basically, you know, if you have one element from up here and one here, you're going to have a very ionic compound. Then we chemists always like to count um, electrons in systems and then we can give a basic idea about a property of a system. And so this is basically based on if we have a closed shell compound, because if you have a closed shell compound or a charged balance one, then we can have a semiconductor or a semi-metal, otherwise we're more likely going to have a metal. And so um, we have closed shell compound with either 8 or 18 valence electrons, depending if we have d electrons or not. And basically, counting works that if you're on the first um, column of the periodic table, you count one electron, and then the further you move on, you count one more. So it goes two, three, four, five, and so on until 11. And then here, once your D shell is filled, you can start counting two electrons again and keep on going up until eight. Um, for ionic compounds, we often like to count um, oxidation states instead. And then you have a positive and a negative charged um, element or um, ion in, in your compound. And if the sum of your charges is zero, you have a charged balanced compound. And here I just I put the most common oxida oxidation states on top, but it's actually a little bit more complicated if you're like up or down in the periodic table. So for, for that, you have to think a little bit more once you start counting. And here are some examples of how this electron um, counting works very nicely. So this is um, the credit to the slide goes to Claudia and Bing Harry, who um, uh, Claudia always likes to show those um, Häusler compounds where electron counting works pretty beautiful. So basically, if you think about a common a semiconductor ca like gallium, gallium arsenide, you see here you have um, eight electrons in total, so a closed shell. And then you can also stuff other um, elements into this uh, structure. And as long as your sum 
remains eight electrons, like here in lithium manganese um, arsenide, you're still going to have a semiconductor. You can also do that with uh, d-electron containing elements and then you sum up to 18. And so here you see the band structures of um, some of those compounds and you see how they're always charged balanced, but it depends on the element um, if you actually have a gap or, um, or a semi-metal, for example, for strontium platinum antimony, you, have a, you get a gap. But if you have bismuth instead of antimony, it's the same electron count. Uh, because this is less ionic and you have more spin orbit couplings, the band move and touch. So this is also why you have to think about electronegativity and um, spin orbit coupling, like how heavy your element is. But our life would be way too simple if 18 electron counting would always work. Um, so there are a lot of phases which are charged balanced, but they do not have eight or 18 electrons. And so this is an example um, on a compound I worked together with is Liz Seibel in the Carver lab. Um, and so she came to me um, because she made a new one to one to one compound and I worked a lot of one 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 phases and she told me she made lanthanum gold antimony. And I said, well, th I don't understand. That doesn't make any sense to me because this has 19 electrons. How is this stable? Because those one to one to one phases usually have 18 electrons. And so here you see, for example, the density of states of lanthanum gold tin, which was known. You see how the Fermi level is in a pseudo gap, so it's charge balanced. So um, we were wondering how, how we fit the extra electron in this phase. And then uh, Liz realized when she was trying to solve the crystal structure that she had to double the unit cell. And then I had the idea, wait, maybe we can solve it if we move those gold atoms closer together. And um, that actually converged the refinement because now those two gold atoms form a bond. And those electrons in the bonds get basically localized to the core states and they don't count into your electron count anymore. So if you calculate the density of states of this compound, you also find that your Fermi level lies within the pseudo gap because you basically still have 18 electrons. You don't count one extra from the gold that is bonded. And there's actually a lot of those phases who do those things, they're called zintl phases. And a really famous one is um, calcium silicide. And I think Josh is going to tell more about this particular compound later. And so here in this compound, you have um, silicon atoms which are bonded to each other. And if you count the electrons, it doesn't match at all with your electron count, but you still have a charge balanced compound. And I'm going to tell you in a bit why it's still charge balanced, but like the really important point I want to make with this is like you really have to look at your crystal structure before you count your electrons and see if there's any bonding that you have to account for. You cannot just blindly count electrons. So I, I gave you two examples of phases. One, here we had eight, uh, 19 electrons, so more than we expected, and here we had less electrons, five per silicon, than we expected. So why do we sometimes have more and sometimes have less electrons? So difference here lies if, we, if our atoms which are bonded to each other are cations or anions. So we can have poly cations or poly anions. And if we have poly cations, we can basically imagine, so if you, if you want to count if a, if a compound is charged balanced, we, we think about the anion and we want the anion to have a closed shell. So if now the cations form a poly cation, not all the electrons are donated to the anions. So some of them don't count into your countings and so you're going to count more than you actually need. But if it's the other way around and you fall, form a poly anion, your anions are bonded to each other so they share electrons so they need less than eight to have a closed shell. So if you have less than eight electrons, you, you have to look out for poly anions. So you can form this simple roots. If you count more than eight, check if you have poly cations. If you have less than eight, check if you have poly anions. And so then there's a nice, um, little formula, you can um, actually look about the number of bonds you expect based on your electron counts. For example, for calcium silicide, um, you count that you have 10 electrons in total and because you have two silicons, so you count your electrons per anion, you have five um, uh, electrons per silicon. And if you subtract those number from the eight electrons for a closed shell compound, you get a number of three and that means each silicon has to be bonded to three other silicons to have a closed shell compound. And so this is basically a, a checkup you can do if you count your electrons and you, you count on your calculate your bonding number. If you find that, you know your compound is going to be charge balanced again. And I just want to show you um, how I like to count electrons in zirconium silicon sulfide, the compound which was mentioned several times yesterday already, which is the Dirac semi-metal we started working on recently. 
And here, if you count your electrons, you find that you have 14, which is also 14 per silicon. And if you subtract this number from 18, you get a number of four, and you see that each silicon is bonded to four other silicons. So therefore, this compound is also charge balanced, although it wouldn't be expected. Okay, so this was a lot about traditional solid state chemistry. In more modern ways, we also started thinking about how we can relate crystal structures to properties. And um, we don't only think about Dirac and semi, uh, Dirac and Weiss semi-metals, we think about lots of different properties and a famous example about how the structure type um, dictates a certain properties is given with the iron arsenide superconductors where you have a structural motive which is found in all different su su um, iron-based superconductors. So basically it means we can, for lots of different properties, we can think about structural motives or structural types that are common to hostess properties and then think about mat more materials with that certain properties. And we do that by basically finding those um, analogons in the structures and then um, we can either go to a crystal structure database like the ICSD and look for compounds that show the mode if we want to or we can also use the chemical concepts of ionic radii and bonding and electron counting to basically um, uh, uh, think about uh, new compounds that could be exist and stable but then it's really important to stick to the rules to um, come up with the compounds that is likely to actually exist. Um, and even um, more modern soil state chemistry, some of us started looking at electronic structures as well because now we have commercially available codes and it's easy for us to calculate them. And then we don't only um, want to combine um, crystal structure and properties, but also combine it with the electronic structure. And we can look for some motives within the electronic structures, like for example, Van Hove's singularity for superconductivity or for Dirac and Weil materials is actually very simple because we can identify those uh, features directly from the electronic structure. So this gives us basically a triangle of things, three things we can connect and find relations to. Okay, now I'm coming to the topic about um, how we actually think about free to direct semi-metals. I want to start with um, cadmium arsenide because it was the first one discovered and it was discovered in Beijing in 2014 or predicted that it's going to be um, a free to direct semi-metal. But around the same time, I think they started thinking about it. Quinn Gibson and the Kava Lab also came up with the idea. And since I don't know the reasoning of, of those people, I will tell you um, Quinn's reasoning about why this should be a free to direct semi-metal. And um, so basically what Quinn was thinking about was that if you want to have a compound with a zero density of states, like you need to have a charged balance compound. And so, because then you only have a crossing at a single point for a direct semi-metal. So electron counting is the uh, first important step to know that you're charged balanced. And then for to, to have a zero band gap, you need to have a good ratio between ionic or bonding, like electronegativity difference and um, spin orbit coupling to not have too much or too little density of states, basically, and not have a band gap. So then, um, so, and then he also realized that you need a pretty high sym symmetry space group in order to have allowed crossings. I'm going to tell you a little bit later why that is. Um, so he was looking for highly symmetric charged balance compound with a good ratio between spin orbit coupling and uh, electronegativity difference. And then also reading the old literature ha helps because he noted that noticed that cadmium arsenide was reported to be um, a zero band gap semiconductor and people reported extremely high mobility. So it was his first guess. And then um, he actually was right and it had the, the band structure he was looking for. Um, oh, because this workshop is called Dirac and Weil materials, I have one slide in here about those things. But um, I mean, you all know that in the Dirac point, we have a fourfold degeneracy, and in a Weil, point, a Weil, a Weil ma materials, we can break some symmetry to split them into twofold degeneracy points. But most of the symmetry roles we, we chemists like to think about are not really valid anymore for those predictions, which is why during most of my talk, I'm going to focus on Dirac materials. And um, this is how we think about it. So first of all, I like to separate um, direct materials into two different cases. I call them case one and case two. And cadmium arsenide belongs to the case one direct materials. And this is the schematic um, band structure I like to think about when I think what I need to, to have one. So basically, if you start thinking about a normal 
semiconductor and then we increase spin orbit coupling or we reduce the electronegativity difference so we bring the bands so close together that they overlap and we get a band inversion then you can think about if uh, those uh, crossings are allowed or forbidden, basically if they gap out or if they uh, still have a crossing. If you still have a crossing, we can have a direct semi-metals. And I know lots of you think about very complicated uh, symmetry relations when this is allowed or forbidden. For me as a chemist, I like to picture this with simple group theory, which is something we learn early on in our studies for molecules, to think about the point groups. And when you... Um, when you learn this, you learn you get the, for each point group you get a character table with different arabs. And basically, I, at some point I understood that if you have two of the two different arabs at this um, certain point of your brilliant zone, you can have a loud crossing. But if you have two of the same, it's going to gap. And so this is the, um, dependent on the local symmetry here. So you can have a different point group along gamma x than gamma z. And this is why you have a crossing here and not there. And so that actually tells me that I need to have as many arabs as possible basically to have a higher likelihood that I have two difference which that can cross that doesn't gap, gap out. So this means the higher my symmetry is, the more likely it is I have enough arabs to have a good crossing. So therefore also Quinn noticed you have to look for very high symmetric materials. And additionally, if you include spin orbit coupling, you cannot use your point group anymore. You have to use a double group. And then that significantly reduces your numbers, number of erraps. And if you then look at all the double groups, you see that you need to have at least C4, C3, or C6 symmetry in order to even possibly have two different erraps that can cross. And so this for us is very convenient because it rules out any, everything orthorhombic, monoclinic or triclinic to look at. And it means we can just screen the database for anything hexagonal, cubic or tetragonal. Um, so here I just put the character tables like we chemists like to look at them to show you. Um, so this is basically the difference in cadmium arsenide. Cadmium arsenide along gamma x you have C2V point group and along gamma z you have the C4V. And you see here's the C2V point group. This is your symmetry operations and um, how the eigenvalues are to it. Um, and here are your different ERAPs labeled. And you see as soon as you have spin orbit coupling, you only have a single ERAP. So you will always gap out along C2V. But along C4V, you have two different ones and you can have a protected crossing. But this doesn't mean as if I have the C4V point group along some point that I definitely gonna have a free Dirac semi-metal because I can still have two of uh, both of my bands having gamma six, for example, as they wrap and then they're still gonna gap. So that means those crossings are still completely coincidental and it's just a guideline that it's possible to have them, but not a criterion that they must have a free Dirac semi-metals within this uh, point group. Um, <coughs> so to sum up how to find case ones. Um, free Dirac semi-metals, we want to look for very high symmetric charge balanced compounds that have a good ratio between spin orbit coupling and electronegativity difference. And because, um, oh no, first I want to show you how that works out for the known materials we have. So here's cadmium arsenide again, it has a tetragonal crystal structure that means along gamma z we have a C4 symmetry axis and this is exactly where we have the Dirac crossing. And here I, I put on the electronegativities of the two elements. So the difference is 0.5. It's not, it's not that much. Um, but spin orbit coupling is also relatively moderate. And then here you see how you can count the electrons in this material. So we, we have 16 in the total compounds. It means we have eight per arsenide. It means we are charge balanced. And the other one is sodium free bismuth, which is hexagonal. And there you have um, a C6 rotation axis between gamma A and uh, therefore we have a crossing along gamma A. The electronegativity difference um, is much higher in this case, but we also have a much more high spin orbit coupling due to the bismuth. So therefore we again have the perfect ratio, and if you count the electrons, we find eight electrons per anion per bismuth, so we are charge balanced again. And um, so Quinn and I weren't really satisfied about uh, this kind of, okay, we need a good ratio between electronegativity difference and spin orbit coupling. So we were wondering at some point if you can quantify that a little bit better. And so then we started looking at a family of compounds. I named the mother compounds now barium, silver, bismuth. And you can isoelectronically um, substitute a lot of those elements to make a family of compounds with 18 electrons, which are charge balanced. 
and they're hexagonal, and Quinn noticed they do have direct crossings along the gamma A direction, at least some of them. And you see here, for barium silver bismuth, you actually have a really nice free direct semi-metal crossing, but for strontium silver bismuth, it's a little bit more messy. And so this brings me back to the phase diagram or structural map I showed you in the first slide, um, where those exactly those kinds of phases were plotted in the diagram. And the ones which have this um, barium silver bismuth crystal structure are the orange ones up here. So a lot of different compounds within this crystal structure. Those ones are also still hexagonal here. So there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of tunability in order to, to look for the properties. And basically your electronegativity difference is increasing that way and um, spin-orbit coupling is increasing the other way. So you can maybe get a feeling about what is happening there. So Quinn and I calculated the electronic structures of um, lots of those compounds. And um, what we are plotting here is, um, first of all, the red ones are trivial, like they don't have a band inversion, therefore no direct cones, and the orange ones are um, having a direct crossing, but it might be very messy with lots of other bands. And so on the on the y-axis, we plot um, the, density, the leftover density of states at the Fermi level, basically as a measure of how clean the, um, the rock crossing is. And on the x-axis, we plot um, the total nuclear charge, which is a measure for spin-orbit coupling, divided by the electronegativity difference. Um, do we, are we doing question at the end or no? <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so then we see that there's actually a clear, clean boundary of when we actually get a band inversion and when not, um, based on this measure. And we s sort of saw a trend about when we have fewer density of states with this plotting, but we realized if we just plot against nuclear charge, it's like going down way more linear. So meaning spring orbit coupling is more important to clean up the, the bands from, from other bands, uh, the drug cones from other bands. And and this ratio is more important to understand when abandoned version is happening and when not. Um, so before I move on to case two direct semi-metals, I want to have one more slide about direct line nodes, which has been a thing people have been looking at recently because um, the one, those ones belong to the case one. And basically then it's if we are in this um, scenario of the band structure. So we have the band inversion, but we don't gap at any point in the brilliant zone. And so now with the rules I told you about the irreps, it becomes pretty obvious that we need a lot of irreps to have no gapping anywhere around this point. So we need really high symmetric materials. And then it is extremely challenging to find something where this is stable against spin orbit coupling. So um, therefore, those materials are very rare. I got to come back later to this a bit more in detail. And now um, let's move on to case two direct semi-metals, which are the ones, or I like to call them case two, um, that are protected by non-somorphic symmetry. And both Lucas and Andre already gave a nice introduction yesterday about what non-somorphic symmetry is in the space groups. So I like to think about the translational element of the glide plane or screw axis you have in a non-somorphic space group causes a folding of the band. So without it, the band would just go like that and then we fold it and therefore we have some force degenerous points in the brilliant zone. And um, because, it, because it's a folding, if you want to have the Dirac point, um, Fermi level at the point, we need to have a half filled band because like, the band is completely filled uh, the Fermi level is going to be up here. So that means now we're actually looking for not charge balanced compounds. It's very different compared to case one. And the other, um, the, the nice thing about the non-somorphic symmetries is that those points are guaranteed by your space group and it's not an accidental crossing anymore like we had in case one. And so this concept was introduced in 2012 by Kane, at least that's the first time I read about it. And he noticed that in silicon dioxide, which has a non-somorphic space group, you have um, this kind of a drug or tu a band touching at the X point. But we all know that silicon dioxide is a transparent insulator, so therefore this is very much below the Fermi level, and we don't have a free direct semi-metal. So then Kane said, okay, we need a half-filled band, so we add one more electron to the structure, and we put bismuth in, and said in bismuth O2, we have this beautiful drug crossing directly at the Fermi level. So now, before I'm telling you why this compound is not realistic, in my opinion, I just really want to point out that I like this paper, and this is a beautiful concept, and it helped me thinking a lot um, about how we actually can realize those materials, but I don't think this is actually the one where it's going to be realized. And this is a, there are several reasons for that. The first one, you can look just at ionic radii. 
so in this crystal structure, the silicon dioxide crystal structure, we have silicon, it's surrounded by four oxygens in a tetrahedral environment. And if you would put bismuth there, bismuth would be in a tetrahedral environment. And so there are some uh, rules about the ratio of a metal to anion radius and crystal structures that um, tell you about the coordination of um, the atoms. And basically it's when you have a metal to, um, to anion, which is oxygen ratio in your compound larger than 0.7, you're going to have a cubic coordination. If you have something between 0.7 and 0.4, you're going to have an octahedral coordination. And if you have a, a ratio smaller than 0.4, then you can have a tetrahedral coordination. And so those numbers, they just come from think simple geometric um, thinking when you assume that the atoms form completely in a densely packed version. So this is not something empirical, this is really just geometry, and atoms like to form in, in a density be packed um, s uh, fashion, th th there's not going to be any space in your crystal structure. Uh, after the talk, I'm sorry. Um, so you can look online, you can go online and you can look um, at the, this website, I put the link here, and there you find the ionic radii derived by Shannon in the 70s, and then you can um, calculate your ratios. And if you have, uh, and you can look up that oxygen, the, the X oxygen anion has an um, ionic radii of 1.4. And then if you look for silicon, for example, you, you find this table and you see silicon with a pl four plus charge, which is what it has in silicon dioxide. And um, a, a four-fold coordination, what we have here, you find an ionic radius of 0.26. And if you take the ratio, it's going to be below 0.4 and you know tetrahedral coordination is, is allowed, it's, it's fine. But now if you look for bismuth, okay, the first thing you notice, there's no plus four bis bismuth even in the table, and I'll explain you why that is in a minute. But even, and then you see also no four-fold coordination here, but let's just play the game and take the smallest radius we find in the table known for bismuth, which is 0.76, and if you take the ratio, you, we get 0.53, which is larger than 0.4, therefore there's no way bismuth is ever going to be in a tetrahedral coordination. Okay. So here's the reason why there's no bismuth 4 plus. So in bismuth dioxide, we would expect an oxidation state of 4 plus for bismuth. The reason why this is not true is due to the inert pair effect, which was actually mentioned by Andre yesterday. And I just want to explain to you where this comes from for a little while. So it's basically some kind of relativistic effect. We chemists like to think about it pretty intuitively. So we think that, okay, the nucleus is charged positive and the electrons are charged negative and they should be attracted by the nucleus. But the reason they don't they get attracted too close is because the electron shields each other from the positive charge of the nucleus. And so S electrons do a pretty good job of shielding each other because they're in a spherical orbital. But if you go to other orbitals, the shielding gets more and more worse. And once you come to the F orbitals, they actually do a really bad job of shielding each other from the positive charge of the nucleus. So now if you look at the periodic table and when you start filling in the F electrons down here in the lanthanides, for each F electron you're adding, you're also adding a proton to the nucleus. So your nuclear charge gets larger and larger, but the electrons don't shield each other that much anymore. So they feel the positive charge, we call it the effective nucleus charge, much more than, um, than they, the other electrons did before the F shells was filled. And then once, um, when you fill the whole shell and then you, you fill the, the D shell too and you come to the 6S shell, you have this spherical um, orbital around the nucleus which feels a lot of the nuclear charge so it gets contracted <coughs> towards the nucleus and then um, it gets lowered in energy by the, uh, so basically. So here I drew the, the orbitals for um, bismuth which has five electrons filled and so due to the inert pair effect, this gets lowered in energy. So that means I can easily uh, like take away those three electrons up here to make bismuth three plus, but I really, they, those ones don't really want to get um, removed. So getting bismuth four plus is, um, it's pretty difficult. And uh, five plus, I mean, and even if you have four plus, this is always going to disproportionate into three plus and five plus um, because uh, this orbital is so much low in energy and it doesn't want to have a half filled 6s shell. And so this is called the inert pair effect and it's, um, it's larger for thallium and lead than even bismuth and it's also appearing in mercury and gold. And um, as Andre mentioned before, for the potassium mercury antimony, that's actually the reason for the band inversion because the 6s electron gets lowered in energy that much. Um, or in mercury telluride, there's also a reason for the band inversion. And um, this is also important when you think about 
when you want to make up a um, compound that you cannot just pick any random X oxidation state. So bismuth 4 plus is not going to appear. Thallium 2 plus is not going to appear because of this. It's going to have a half a 6 ester. Or gold 2 plus won't appear for the same reason. Um, so now there's a more general problem to having um, non-symorphic um, free Dirac semi-metals, and that is the problem of having a have to have a half-filled band to have it stable. Because compounds with half-filled bands very often um, undergo some kind of distortion to, to, reduce, uh, to not have a half-filled band, basically. They like to do pious distortion, or if the electrons are more localized, they, they um, are mod become mod insulators, and the band splits, and we open up a gap. So we can stabilize half-filled bands in metals with other electron pockets uh, um, around, but really having a clean one is extremely difficult. So then uh, there was a time where Quinn and I still, um, again, were, oh, and Lucas was involved in that too, we were thinking, is there anything, any chemistry knowledge that can help us to circumvent that problem of the half filled band? So then we were thinking back to our organic chemistry lessons. And in organic chemistry, there are uh, molecules which we call radicals, which don't have half filled bands, but they have a half filled orbitals. It's a molecule. And those ones are extremely reactive. If you have them, you usually react with everything and not stable. But there are some rules for making them more stable. Basically, if you put more residues to it, this radical becomes more stable. Or even better is if you delocalize the re uh, re radical about a conjugated network. So here, for example, in this one, this electron can travel around all those double bonds and the radical gets much more stable. And then you can keep playing this game, and if you come to this one, your electron can hop around all over those rings, and this radical is actually stable at room temperature and has a half-filled orbital. So we were wondering if we can expand this concept to inorganic chemistry, and if there's anything in inorganic chemistry where we can also delocalize an electron over a larger area and therefore stabilize it. And then we were thinking of cluster compounds, which are compounds where we have also metal-metal bonds, and they form those discrete clusters. Um, uh, yeah, and then those clusters have molecular orbitals, basically similar to a radical, and we could delocalize um, an electron or a hole over the whole cluster. And so there are some examples here. For example, the Chevrel phases, they're pretty famous because they're superconducting. And um, they have this molybdenum um, octahedron as clusters. And the bands of this are completely filled when you have 24 electrons in it, which is one pair for each of the 12 bonds you're forming. So there are different electron count rule counting rules and clusters as well. Be careful. Um, and this one actually isn't completely filled, so it's possible to not to have partially filled bands in those compounds. But this one is in a somorphic crystal structure, so it didn't help us. But then Quinn found this really nice paper by Chevrel himself, where he said, OK, you can condense these clusters to make larger ones. And at some point, if you keep condensing more and more of these um, octahedral clusters together, you get an infinite chain of clusters and compounds. And then this chain here has a screw axis, so then it becomes a non somorphic space group. And in his paper, they also counted the electrons. And in this compound is down here, um, which has the non somorphic space group. Um, we find that the band filling, um, that there's e there are extra electrons in the band. So the band filling isn't completely or discrete. So then, um, oh, here you see the crystal structure of this compound again. Um, you see uh, you have the, this is hexagonal, and um, this is the AB plane, and you have the clusters here, and along the C axis, you see this infinite chain of the cluster. You see how there are triangles, one's facing up and then facing the other direction, so there's a screw axis here. And then Quinn calculated the electronic structure, and he found he has this non-somorphic sti uh, sticking points, um, as we expect in a non-somorphic group, and m much fewer bands messing around with it. And of course, this is still not perfect, but um, we still believe that the concept for looking in clusters to stabilize a uh, uh, half-filled band or a delocalized electron is probably the best way to um, finding those kind of compounds. Mm -hmm. and, and with this, how much time do I have left? <laughs> Oh, oh shit, I'm too fast. Okay, no, I'm, I'm, I'm super fast. <laughs> That's okay. So I, I just want to um, uh, tell a little bit about uh, my own research in the end, about how I used exactly this kind of way of thinking to come up with some drug and um, drug materials and then actually make them. And this is going to be a story about two different compounds, and here you see the crystals. Um, yeah, and first I want to... Um, I want to show you the way of thinking that I proceed in order to come up with this. So 
basically I need to come to those workshops here or talk to theorists or read their papers to get an idea about what, what is looked for and what, it, what is people are of interest for and get some basic gu guidelines of how to find the material. And then I use exactly those uh, uh, concepts I just taught you with ionic radii and, uh, and, and electron countings to basically come up with a material that could host those properties then I can calculate the electronic structure and see if it's really this type of material and if I'm correctly I can make it. And then um, after making this, this step is important. I have to verify it actually has the crystal structure I assumed here because if not I have to loop back because the calculation is going to be uh, wrong. And then if this is like matching this red part of the circle then I can go measure properties. And um, so this is about um, the compound calcium phosphide, um, which has a free to direct line node. And um, I came across this during my PhD at Princeton. And it was when I started thinking about what kinds of materials could have those line nodes. And um, as I mentioned before, I realized those materials need to be extremely highly symmetric. And it's best if I don't have to worry about spin orbit coupling and, uh, and, double, group, uh, and double groups because I have more ERPs if I don't don't have to worry about it. So um, I was looking for really highly symmetric materials with very light elements back then. And it happened that um, during that time, Lily or she in the Carver lab, she was an undergraduate, I mentored, she discovered a new compound which was made of calcium and phosphide, um, or phosphorus, and um, which are both light elements. And we noted noticed from the diffraction pattern that the symmetry is very high. So I was interested in solving that and looking if this was matched this idea. And I call this slide surprises in household goods because all of you know calcium phosphide because you can buy it. It's red poison. Um, usually it's amorphous and um, it doesn't, it's, not, it's not crystalline, but you can, you can buy it in the store and put it in your house and kill, your red, kill the rats with it. And Lilia was very brave because um, she just put that red poison into a tantalum tube and heated it to very high temperatures, like 1200 degrees. And then, although our advisor raised some concerns about the lab maybe catching a fire, she trusted in her tantalum sealing skills, the tube sealing skills, and made this new face and a crystalline version of red poison, basically. And um, so we figured out that this crystallizes in the manganese five silicon three crystal structure, but it has vacancies on the calcium side, so we get the stoichiometry of three to two. And we also found some evidence for other phase containing hydrogen, which is a common phenomenon if you work with rare earth elements because they're often contaminated by hydrogen. Um, and then the hydrogen sits here in, in those um, calcium hexagons. And I was interested in, in both of those compounds because both were contain, uh, like only contain high elements and were um, hexagonal, so highly symmetric. Um, oh yeah, this is important why, why we have the vacancies because calcium 5P3 would not be charged balanced, whereas the 3 to 2 is. And we were looking for charged balanced compounds. So we took the, the sample and we shipped it to the synchrotron to get extremely high resolution powder diffraction data. I mean, many of you aren't familiar looking to this, but if you have 100,000 counts on your main peaks, that's pretty good. And then you, have, um, you get a lot of information about your crystal structure. And then we saw that um, if, we, um, if we introduce vacancies uh, in the calcium, the, the refinement, the fit is uh, significantly getting better. So we were relatively confident we have it. Um, so then I calculated the electronic structure and so here's the structure for the fully ordered like five to three compound and you see you have a direct line node like we were hoping were be below the Fermi level and then if you model the vacancies I just did that with the virtual crystal approximation this line node uh, moves e exactly to the Fermi level. Um, spin orbit coupling would gap this line node because the symmetry along this line is C to V however it's very low so we don't really observe it in our calculation that much. Um, the hydrate was a trivial insulator, sadly, so we look for that too, but this doesn't have a line node. So um, we, we published the results, but um, of course um, we are um, experimentalists, so we, are not, we weren't really happy with um, just having um, made the compound and having the electronic structure prediction, so we tried to actually grow crystals and make it. And now we, we face the serious ch challenges of a chemist, because the hydrate likes to grow and it's much more stable than the other compound. 
And um, additionally, um, the, the, this is a high temperature phase, so it's really hard to get, grow, uh, to get large crystals because you have to quench it from high temperatures. It's extremely air sensitive as well. So I, I don't even have a picture of the calcium phosphate crystals themselves. They look similar, but they're black. Um, but we made some crystals, but they're extremely small. They're good enough for single crystal diffraction and verifying the crystal structure that way but uh, they're not good enough for RPIS or anything else. And I just want to mention this because I often read in some theory uh, prediction papers that somebody already grew a crystal of this material and therefore it's likely to have. I guess it's a good indication, but often when I look to these papers, they grew a millimeter size, or not millimeter, like a micrometer sized crystal good enough for diffraction. That doesn't necessarily mean you can grow a crystal good enough for RPIS. Um, and so the second, thing is, um, which Mars already uh, mentioned, is that when I started my postdoc, I joined a group which thinks a lot about um, applications and cheap materials and things industry want to look about. And then I started wondering about that too. Like, can you make actual free Dirac materials which uh, like could be upscaled in synthesis and used in an application at some point? Because the ones we have right now are toxic, are often extremely air sensitive, and they're not made necessarily out of cheap elements. So here you have a periodic table, and the larger your circle is, the more, uh, the higher the abundance in the earth crust of the element is. So if you want to make something cost efficient, you want to try to make it out of these elements. And then um, additionally, in the known free Dirac semi-metals, the range of linear dispersed bands is often very narrow. So if you want to um, upscale the synthesis, you're going to have a lot more defects. So your Fermi level is going to wander around. And um, so you uh, like uh, better want to have a material where this linear dispersion is um, about a large energy range. And while I was thinking if I find a material about this, I read that paper by Wolfgang Trimmer and Roald Hoffmann. And actually, I'm loving that Wolfgang Trimmer is the first author here because I'm back in Mainz and he is a professor here. And he taught me in my first semester everything I was just teaching to you. So it's very beautiful that um, this paper made, uh, made me find <coughs> this discovery. And so in this paper, um, Wolfram Trim and Roland Hoffman, they looked at square net compounds, which have a square net arrangement of atoms. And they noticed that, it's all, that they often um, undergo distortions. And they said this is because there's some residual de density of states in the square net ar arrangement. And then it wants to distort to get rid of this. And back when, nobody was thinking about Dirac electrons. So they weren't mentioning anything about the crossing. They're just always saying, OK, this is not favored. So it's gaps. And then you have a band gap. And then um, in this paper, they kept saying, OK, we put like some kind of compound into the idealized zirconium silicon sulfide crystal structure. And then it has this kind of electronic structure. And then it distorts because it doesn't want that. So then we wonder, OK, what is this compound zirconium silicon sulfide? Why do we keep mentioning it at the idealized structure? And um, does it actually have an, a perfect square net? So I looked at the published crystal structure in the ICSD, and I uh, realized that it like based on the published data, has an idealized square net. So I, I had high hopes for it having the rock crossings. And it also fit all my other requirements that it is made only of abundant elements. So you, here you see them circled. It is extremely, it was reported, the powder was reported to exist um, and to, to be really stable in, in water and air and even acids. Um, and then it's also not toxic. And from the crystal structure, I already could see that it, there's a cleavage plane, which is very important if you want to measure arpis or something. So I thought it was a really promising compound to look at. And so I'd calculated the electronic structure and I noticed, noticed it doesn't only have direct crossing like I was thinking it would have, it also has a very huge energy dispersion of linear bands, much more than anything else known before. And then there are lots of crossings on the Fermi level, like in the case one, one type, which form this kind of line node in the brilliant zone. And those gap slightly with spin orbit coupling, but not that much that you wouldn't expect extremely low masses and high mobilities in these materials. But then I also noticed, which I wasn't thinking of before, that there is a non-somorphic Dirac cone at the X point because this is a non-somorphic space group. It's slightly below the Fermi level, of course, because we are in a charged balance compound. So um, 
Yeah, just about the non-somorphic cone real quick. This really ma nicely matched the prediction which just came like a month before I was looking at this. Um, it was a prediction by Kane that if you have a square net arrangement of atoms, you're going to have um, those 2D non-somorphic type of Dirac semi-metals. And since I have the square net in my compound, I was thinking if I see the same feature and I see that, like as Kane said, in his model band structure, the bands go from gamma to X and meet here and fold on the same energy along XM. And I do have the same motive right here in my electronic structure. So I thought it was a very nice first step to verifying this proposal. So um, then I grew the crystals. And it took me some time to figure it out, but at some point I realized you can grow huge crystals. So this is one millimeter scale bar, very large, nice crystals with iodine vapor transport in a tube. And um, those crystals cleave really nicely, it's great. And we also verified the crystal structure because it was important for me to know that there's really no distortion in the silicon square net lattice because that would gap out my drag cones. And um, I just show one example here of a um, precession electron diffraction image where you see that you really have this perfect square arrangement of, um, of dots. So then I gave the crystal, uh, crystals to Christian to uh, measure Arpis on it. And I'm not going to talk that much about it because Christian is going to tell you much more about it later. But I just want to point out that we, here are the really the drag cones with a high linear dispersion. Here are this case one crossings at the Fermi level that's slightly above. And here you can see the crossing of the non-somorphic drag cones. There are some additional surface states and I'm not going to comment on them now. You can leave the, I'm going to leave this for Christian to discuss. But um, the point I wanted to make with this is that we verified the electronic structure um, we predicted with ARPIS. And it doesn't stop with zirconium silicon sulfide because it crystallizes in an extremely common structure type. Actually, if you just look at the structure types, there are like 2,000 compounds in this. If you look for one which are more um, covalently bonded, like zirconium silicon sulfide, you, you have uh, 200 compounds left in this. This is just a small table of some um, isoelectronic simil similar ones, so you have a large families of compounds to explore and um, you can think about if you maybe find a way through doping or other stabilizing to move the non somorphic cone to the Fermi level or maybe introduce some magnetism in there to find some different kind of wine materials in this material, so there's a large playground in this family here. And with this I'm done and I really want to take some time to acknowledge all the people First, like who, whose research I talked about and worked with me on it. So first of all, the two groups I was in while, um, while making this research and the two bosses, Professor Carver and um, Bettina Lodge. And then um, the students who worked on this, or, or not only students, students and other researchers. So I talked about the gold-gold bonding compounds, which was uh, done with Liz. And then I talked a lot about Quinn and I talked a lot about his reasoning about direct semi-metals. Um, so he did a lot of the work I just introduced. Lily, I mentioned she made the calcium phosphide and was involved in this project. Um, Mars and Christian both worked with me on the zirconium silicon sulfide project and this is Andy and Judith, my uh, two current students who are also working on zirconium silicon sulfide and related materials. And with this I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.